originally, that was one of our first episodes that we did. We recorded this back in March of this year, talking about depression, but we talked about it as a trauma stage instead of as a trauma reaction. Mm. That episode aired on April 18th of this year. So we're going to basically recap what it was that we did talk about last April. Um, But the trauma response of depression is slightly different from the trauma stage of depression. So you can have gone through all of the stages. You could be all the way into acceptance and you feel like you're still clinging on to this depression. And that's because it is a separate entity from the stage. There's a huge connection between the two. There certainly is. There certainly is. And also um, a huge connection between PTSD and depression, which are two distinct things. Uh, But they are very closely interlinked when it comes to trauma. Right. And it's so funny that sometimes it feels like uh, this is specifically trauma reaction, depression. Depression feels like it just comes out of absolutely nowhere. It comes out of the blue. Um, It can be caused by, it can be triggered by other stuff. It can be caused by a divorce or trauma, but it can be triggered by things that remind you of that trauma. And you feel like you're back into that same place where you're having problems coping with um, the, the painful experience that no longer exists except in your memories. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And also it's important to make a distinction between, um, the medical condition that is sort of um, a clinical diagnosis through it, it might be genetically developed or it might be um, oh here I go I've just got an, a mental blank <laughs> oh goodness me that's not that doesn't happen very often these days uh, it used to before when I was in a depressed state but uh, not not very often these days you know so what that means let me recap. You just had a trigger. Ah, yeah, yeah. It made your mind go blank. Even though the depression didn't stick around very long, you just had a trigger that wiped out your brain. Hmm. And that is a really interesting thing that you bring up because basically with with depression and trauma, um, there is a, a neurobiological and physiological change that happens that we've talked about before. And that happens um, in relation to depression with trauma. And um, it's about how we deal with that. That's the most important thing. But let's let's just go over uh, what are some examples of depression in relation to trauma. And maybe if we can delineate that and look at the difference between trauma and, uh, sorry, depression and PTSD. So I've actually got some really good examples already. Um, so, here in the U.S., as as we are getting ready to record this episode, we're getting close to Veterans Day here in the U.S. Now, this is going to uh, air the day after my birthday. <laughs> but uh, in real life, as we are talking, we're approaching Veterans Day. And that's a day when we remember our war veterans. Mm. My husband is a Navy veteran. So veterans returning home from a war zone, they might have some pretty terrible memories uh, and feelings of guilt or regret. They have uh, been injured or they've lost friends. They've seen people die. Disaster survivors, they may have lost a loved one in some kind of a disaster like a hurricane or a tornado or a tsunami or an earthquake. Um, They may have lost a home or they may have been injured. They may have lost a limb. They may have broken bones in their body. And survivors like us of violence or abuse uh, can feel like we don't trust people anymore. And every single one of these things can lead to both depression and PTSD. They are separate things, but they do overlap a lot. Kind of like human trafficking and human smuggling. They're separate issues. They need to be addressed as separate issues, even though they coincide so often. Mm -hmm. So can you give me some examples of what uh, depression looks like? Or, oh, actually, you know, I can do it. Okay. I've got a little list here if you'd like me to read it out. Absolutely. So in terms of depression, uh, what the symptoms include are lack of energy, 
a lack of interest and pleasure in activities that you used to enjoy, significant weight loss or gain, excessive sleeping or insomnia, excessive guilt, inability to concentrate, feelings of worthlessness, and recurrent th thoughts of death or suicide. So you've had some of those, I believe, and I certainly have. Absolutely. And it's important to note that you don't have to have all of those to acknowledge that you have depression too. Yes. Not everybody who feels depressed has suicidal ideas. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think it's important. That's a, that's a really good thing to raise. Um, I remember when I was going through a really extreme depressive period that um, I had significant weight loss and the insomnia was just out of this world. I, I literally would sleep only maybe two to three hours a night. Oh, and that's so my awful. body was, yeah, it was awful. Totally. My body was totally dysregulated and um, I became very gaunt and, you know, people around me started asking questions about what was going on because um, I, I, I also lacked that energy. You know, I just didn't want to do anything probably because I wasn't sleeping. <laughs> Um, so it's, it's, it's really hard. It's a really hard place to be. And, um, coming out of that is the big challenge. And, uh, when it's related to trauma, it, the challenge is even intensified because you've got to deal with the trauma. You've got to deal with the depression, what goes first, the chicken or the egg kind of thing. And, um, it's a hard place to be. Huh. And when you're dealing with, PTSD on top of the depression when they coexist like that. I mean, what PTSD looks like is you can sometimes have really vivid flashbacks where you feel like the trauma is happening right now. That's severe, that vivid. Um, you can have really intrusive thoughts or really intrusive images flashing in your head. Specifically, if you have a near photographic memory, like I do, you don't forget these things. Yeah. You can have yeah. nightmares, which nightmares is going to be the next episode that we're going to be discussing. Um, and intense distress um, at very real or rather symbolic reminders of your trauma. And you can have physical sensations like pain, sweating, nausea, trembling, all this stuff. When you couple all of that with depression, you feel like the world is caving in on you. It's not just the roof. It's everything. Exactly. Yeah. And don't forget the hypervigilance. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that is a never ending thing in my world. <laughs> and you know, I got to say in some regard, it is a superpower. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's talk about that. You know, I like that because what we're doing there is reframing a story. And for me personally, that was a thing that actually helped me get out of where I was in terms of my headspace my whole body and the story I was telling myself that kept me going down that, you know, vortex of depression. So reframing, let's, let's talk about that. I like that. <laughs> so that hypervigilance and recognizing it as being like this, this superpower that we have, once we're at these situations, we have to kind of hone it and use it as a skill rather than having it be a knee jerk reaction. Um, but it can be both depending on what it is that you're going through and I, your hypervigilance and your depression can be enough to get you out of those situations that you're in. If you recognize that you don't feel like you anymore, you don't know what's going on, but you don't feel like you and you're sad all the time. And you're like, this isn't me. And you're depressed and you're, you are contemplating or thinking happily about suicide. Take note of that recognize these things, the hypervigilance and the depression as being your red flags and your daily nonstop, every single minute of the day reminders, there's something very wrong and you need to take that control to fix it. And we did talk about having a need for control. That episode aired on July 11th. If you want to know more about that, just go back to that episode. But yeah. That need for control and that hypervigilance, which we talked about on October 17th, and that depression, all of these things kind of pile up. And they are here 
to trigger your brain into having a response of action. Whereas with when you're in that depression state, um, what's happening is that your body freezes. Uh, if we think about the fight flight response, um, essentially what's happening in your body is that you're just completely frozen. You you have that incapacity to take control over anything. And um, it, it, it's a physiological response. Right. And it's a terrible place to get stuck. Yeah. You feel like your feet are stuck in concrete. You can't move even if you want to. That's a really good analogy because I certainly have felt that. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've actually expressed it in that way. Um, the other way I've felt um, and expressed it is feeling like I'm in quicksand, that I, I just can't get out of the quicksand. And regardless of what I try and do, it's, it's impossible. And the more you try yeah. to do, the more stuck you seem to get. Absolutely. Yeah. Which so is really hard. That's when yeah. it's important to recognize that the asking for help is not a weakness, but a strength. And we talked about yeah. that before we got on the show, but we I, did. I, I think I mentioned something about it. It's like lifting a 200 pound barbell. I wouldn't be able to do that right now. I would have to lift other things first to kind of get, but gain that strength to build that muscle, to be able to lift that 200 pound barbell. It's the same thing with asking for help. If you don't feel like you can ask somebody for mental or emotional help, start asking for help with little things first. Can you pass me that ink pen? Start with little yeah. things. Once yeah. you build up your trust of being able to ask somebody for help, then you can go to them with the bigger things. And and let's remind ourselves of, of why we end up in that state. It's because we've felt out of control with the trauma that we've experienced. And right. uh, we felt like that we couldn't get out of it. So that's why we freeze. And that's why it's so important to, as you say, rebuild that muscle, rebuild that skill of um, being able to start trusting and taking control of our environment. Right. Yeah. So some of the long-term consequences of having a trauma reaction of depression. Some of those long-term consequences are severe long-term consequences as in, you know, a long-term solution to a short-term problem. That's probably the, one of the most severe cases uh, would be the, the ending of one's life. But there's a lot of other things that lead up to it also. You can try to medicate yourself. You know, when I was in Scotland and in the middle of my abuse, I tried to medicate myself with alcohol. A lot of people turn to alcohol or drugs or cigarettes. I was a heavy smoker back then. And the worst something was the more I smoked. And it wasn't because I enjoyed it because I hated smoking. It was because I saw it as my way of expressing that there's something wrong. Maybe if I smoke more, somebody will pay attention and notice that there's something wrong, that I've got to be stressed out if I'm having all of this. It was the same thing with the alcohol was looking for a way to numb myself so that see, people would, number one, see that there was something wrong and that I was running from something, but nobody noticed. And number two, I was chasing that blackout so that I wouldn't remember what was happening. Self-medication is a very serious problem when you're depressed. And also it's another way of controlling things. It is. Taking back control. That's the only thing that you feel like you have control over. Um, and quite often in our society, people are criticized for that and belittled for that. But it, it is actually, as you said, it's a cry for help. It's, um, I, I don't know what I'm doing here. Please, please, somebody look at this and see that I need some help. Right. Yeah. Somebody intervene. Somebody offer mm -hmm. to help. Somebody to ask me if I'm okay. Yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of other uh, things that depression kind of leads to also. You know, we, we talked previously about the isolation, about shutting down, not wanting to go places, not wanting to talk to people, not wanting to do all the things that you normally love to do, even if those are solo activities, like writing, painting, drawing. If you 
if you're not doing these things anymore, this is a long-term side effect of depression. Yeah. It's not Absolutely. fun. It isn't. And um, for me, that's been one of the things that I've found. Um, and when I look back on my life, I can really identify those periods where I was depressed. And um, I identify it through not actually participating in those activities. And one thing I think I said to you off air is that uh, yesterday I sat down with all my clothes that no longer fit or that I don't like um, in terms of the styles anymore. So I'm pulling apart all the material and I'm going to get creative and make up some of my own designs and put, you know, obscure colours together. And um, But I'm being creative and that actually me getting back in touch with myself and one of the things that I found um, coming out of depression is that more and more I've been able to reconnect with the things that I love to do and that I am I get excited about whereas when you're depressed you you don't have that you don't have that excitement at all yeah you just kind of wallowing but around and I think probably one of my biggest habits when I did have pretty severe depression was hiding in my room with the door closed, watching Netflix. Mm -hmm. That was kind of my thing. Yeah. Yeah. You sit there and binge watch TV shows. And when that show ends, you just pick another one. And the reason I binge watch TV shows instead of movies was because it was a longer distraction. A movie would only distract me for an hour and a half to two hours at a time. Whereas a TV Mm. show, an hour after an hour, after an hour, after an hour, could go on for days. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds very familiar. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. sounds very familiar. And Pints also, of ice cream and a frozen pizza. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the other interesting thing about that is the attention span that's required to watch an episode. Yeah. Compared to watching a movie. Um. So I think for me, that's one of the other reasons I was binge watching episodes uh, of TV series because the actual plot was so basic um, mm-hmm. that you could actually concentrate on it. <laughs> and even if you missed this, it didn't matter. Whereas with a movie, you know, you've got to stay fairly focused. So Right. And I had a tendency to watch things that I had already seen three, four, five times. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like my favorite Disney movie is Tangled. If I was in the movie, in the mood for a movie, I would pop in Tangled and play it on repeat six, seven, eight times because I didn't have to pay attention. Yeah. You know, my brain could be yeah. somewhere else. I'm also a huge fan of Star Trek. I would put on Star Trek The Next Generation and watch the entire series all the way through and then start it again. Now that's a clear sign of major depression. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think that's important that we really hone in on that because a lot of us do binge watch and it's sort of like it's become a bit of a thing in our society. But there's a fine line between being really involved in it and whether this is a sign that things are not right in our lives um, mm-hmm. and, and taking action. So, you know, in terms of taking action, what kind of things helped you? to overcome your depression? You know, here's one that is going to shock a lot of people. Um, And it's not something that everybody can do. And it's not something I would necessarily even suggest. I became a flight attendant. (laughs) I would have been perfectly happy being a hermit for the rest of my life. But here was this opportunity before me to be hired as a flight attendant and to go travel the world. At the time, I was terrified of traveling because of what I had been through on my last travel. I was terrified of going places I had never been to before. Absolutely terrified of leaving my home. I was so scared of the entire world. But I also recognized that I had this, I didn't care if I lived or died attitude anymore. And because of that, I became a flight attendant. And doing that job got me out of my little comfort zone space and back out into the world. So probably the way I would translate that for most other people is to stay in touch with people you care about. Don't withdraw from life. It's not going to do you any favors to withdraw from life. 
You definitely need to be more active because going for long walks when I was a flight attendant, when I got an overnight in Seattle and wanted to go see the, the famous tower there, or when I went to Wichita, Kansas and decided I was going to go to the botanical gardens or yeah, all of these travels all around the country. I was not ever going to see these landmarks unless I went to them myself. So taking up some form of exercise really helps in a big way. That was massive for me. Facing your fears. You don't want to avoid the things that you find to be difficult. That's why I became a flight attendant. I was facing my fears. I didn't realize that this one job would change my entire life. And it also, you don't want to drink too much alcohol. For some people, alcohol can become a problem. You know, I mentioned when I was in Scotland, alcohol was a problem for me. For a long time, I went completely with no alcohol at all. Now I very rarely ever have any. And being a flight attendant helped me to curb that appetite for alcohol. It also made me eat healthy because when you're a flight attendant, you don't get paid very much money. I had to bring my own food everywhere I went. And I, when I do that, I cook. And it's a lot cheaper and it's a lot healthier. And so not everybody can become a flight attendant, Amanda. Right. So let's go back <laughs> to maybe thinking about, well, there's somebody at home listening to this. They are, they are on the couch, just binge watching. How do they get themselves off the couch? How do they get themselves to turn off that binge watching television screen and, um, and start to, to do the things that you were talking about, make connections, go for a walk, do some exercise, start cooking. I mean, how do you do that? that that's a hard thing when you're stuck and glued onto the couch. I mean, I remember days where I wouldn't go to the toilet because it was just too much effort to get out of the, get off the couch. Right. And that's why I was saying, it's, it's important. I didn't know that being a flight attendant was going to change my life in such a way. All of these things coincided with that one choice that I made. Had I known that all of these things added up were the things that helped to change my life, I could have reframed that in my own head. So staying in touch and not withdrawing from life, reaching out to my friends, exercising that muscle of asking for help without asking directly for, hey, I'm depressed and I need some help right now. If you're not comfortable with doing that, build up to it. But if you are comfortable with it, do it. It saved my life once. I reached out to a friend of mine and told him, why can't anybody love me? And he told me, 1030 at night, drop everything and come to my house right now and he has no idea he never knew that he saved my life that night you definitely want to be more active take up some exercise a couple of years ago when things got pretty bad for me one of the things that I did outside of being a flight attendant was I started to look up all the different little landmarks in my town and I went to go and visit all of them. I went to the Molly Brown Museum. Molly Brown was one of the survivors from the Titanic. And I went to go and wander through her house. She was also a suffragette and an activist. And she was an incredible person. I never would have known if I hadn't gone to her home. Mm -hmm. She was inspiring. But going to her home got me to be more active, got me out of the house. It got me doing a little bit more exercise. And it helped me to face my fears because I'm terrified of going into a place that I'm not familiar with. And I did that. Uh, I found it to be quite difficult, but I still did it. No matter how much my heart was beating. Heart palpitations episode came out on Halloween. Um, <laughs> at facing my fears, avoiding alcohol, trying to eat healthy. Those things came naturally as I started to do the others. It was, again, building up that muscle. Lifting the five pound barbells before you can lift the 200. Just a little at a time, a little bit every day. If you're telling yourself today, I need to get up and be active, but I really don't feel like it. Force yourself, if you're able, force yourself to get up and walk up and down your stairs. If you have stairs one time, just once, and then go back to what you were doing tomorrow. See if you can do it twice. 
the next day. See if you can do it three times throughout the day. You don't have to do it all at once. I'd be huffing and puffing. <laughs> Just a little bit every day, a little bit more than yesterday. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me one of the key things is, is to find that motivation to to just do something whether it is um you know putting some bread in the toaster so that you can make yourself some toast rather than pull out of the freezer a frozen pizza um it's it's actually it, it's about self-care isn't it and we've talked about this before in other episodes it's that self-care and um finding something in in you that can actually um, break that, that that chain of, of, of negative energy. Probably one of the greatest bits of advice that I ever got was go learn about your world. Mm. It doesn't have to be your world internally. It can be your world externally. It can be your town. It can be your village. It can be your state. It can be your country. There's so much out there that you don't know that you don't know. Yeah. Go and explore it. Find mm -hmm. something that motivates you and inspires you. We live in the age of the internet. It's not far-fetched to think that we can hop on some event website somewhere and find something for free yeah. that might just get up off, get us up off the couch. Yeah. So for in one minute, can you just summarize today's episode for us in terms of uh, what are the key points that people need to go away with? You can go all the way through all of the stages of trauma and still end up with depression, especially in the acceptance phase. Depression isn't somewhere you have to stay. Depression as a trauma response can stick around and it can do odd things to you once in a while. It can pop into your brain and wipe out whatever it was that you were thinking of in just an instant. But it's important to recognize it, understand it, and do what you can to fight it back. By fighting it back, you are taking more control over your life and you're more of control of your situation instead of allowing the prior situations that you lived through to continue to control you. You've got this, but if you do need to ask for help, it's okay to do that too. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe going and seeing a doctor might be a good place to, to start if uh, you're too frightened to go and reach out to anybody else. So it's a big step. It's a big yeah. step. I've never well, met a therapist that didn't have a therapist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, today's episode has been pretty heavy um, and... But then this topic is heavy, so I just hope that uh, anyone out there who's listening today who is in, who has been triggered by this episode, that um, they go out and seek some support. And uh, I think what we might do, Amanda, is actually put on our Facebook page uh, some links to some phone numbers that people can reach out to. That's a wonderful idea. Yeah. Well, thanks. Lovely to see you again, Amanda. Let's uh, look forward to next time. Absolutely. Next time it's nightmares. <laughs>